Normally Courtney kicks off, but I'm going to kick off. But I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the, the recent passing of Bill Trailing. Uh, we all know Bill. Bill was a, a colleague and a friend, a longtime paddler in Mississauga who coached, was the head coach in Mississauga and was involved in coach education. And many of us got to see him uh, in the last year or so at different different functions. He was It was always great to see him. He was so courageous we even saw him at uh he came out to a race in, in welland in the summer so um and we just maybe just have a, a a temporary moment of silence just to acknowledge the the life of bill trailing thank you courtney Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at our second go of it. I'm Courtney Stott, apprentice coach with Canoe Kayak Ontario and national team spring kayaker. I am also Rob's favorite niece. Mm, that's what she says. She thinks so. She doesn't. She forgets how many nieces I have. But uh, <laughs> I'm Rob. I'm a canoe kayak coach. Uh, just recently starting uh, a new position at Chima Aquatic Club in Nova Scotia. Together, Bob and I have been delivering a series of webinars that we like to call Stotnars. Uh, we started this project at the beginning of my two-year apprenticeship, covering various topics related to coaching and training. Today, we're happy to have Paul Larson with us, a sports scientist, professor, endurance coach, author, podcast host, CEO, I'm probably missing something. Um, and it's worth noting that Paul has experience um, working with kayakers in New Zealand, in particular, Lisa Carrington and her coach, Gordy Walker. So we have a packed agenda for today, focusing on high intensity interval training known as HIT, and touching on individualization, fiber typology, periodization, and the anaerobic speed reserve. All right. Uh, welcome, Paul. How are you? Are you in, uh, in the mountains in BC? You got it, Rob. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Hi everyone. Um, it really stoked with the with the great turnout, and uh, yeah, it's great to see everyone. And um, yeah, share your passion for sport, of course. Yeah. And um, and I do love the love the sport of canoe kayak as well. So I haven't spent some time there. So thanks for having me, Rob. And yeah, and, and, yeah, and Paul, you're you're great to kind of organize this with. You're so responsive to get get uh, to to get you on here. Sometimes it's uh, you can go back and forth a lot, but you're you're pretty easy and. Uh, in addition to your your hit research, I know you've done stuff with the heat training and 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 dealing with the with with cold and uh, with the ice slushies and uh, heart rate variability, low carb training and and other areas. So you're you're pretty uh, widely uh, versed. And uh, before Courtney kicks it off, uh, just we'll entertain questions at the end. Please put them in the chat. Haley will get to them, and we'd like you to come off uh, come on your camera to ask the question directly to Paul. So you can put them in the chat on an ongoing basis, but we won't take the questions until the end. Okay, thanks, Courtney. All right, Paul, so you have a presentation for us um, that was on Lisa Carrington from when you worked around the program. Yeah, Would yeah. Like to so start I, with that? I think it's a good place just to, just to kind of start. It's just nice to have like, you know, 10 minutes. Um, I'm basically repurposing a presentation that we gave right after the London Olympics with my, uh, my colleague Rod Siegel, who was working directly with Gordon and then Dan, and Dan Plews as well, who now still works with Gordy. Um, so I don't think things have changed too much. And I think this presentation we gave in Wellington uh, there after the Olympics was, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was, it's well and truly lost the embargo meant and whatnot. So I don't think there's anything super sensitive that I'm, that I'm violating from high performance sport in New Zealand. And a lot of these, you'll, you'll notice that a lot of the principles, are within the book now anyways but you can kind of uh, yeah we'll we'll do our best here just to uh present this um come on to the window and one one second there we go can you guys you see it we can now. Okay. Um, great. So this again, this I'm recycling a presentation that we gave 
post London, and we're just going to show a few of the principles and whatnot. And then a lot of these come to the question as well. So I'll pass through these ones and all of all of that and our success. Because again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, I want to maybe the philosophy. Um, do the, yeah, do the basics well. I think that's really, really important. If you look at the New Zealand success, that's really kind of because again, you've got to you can imagine the New Zealand system with a very small population of four million. Um, we really had to do the basics well, um, and, you know, because there's all the the various different um, you know philosophies around the marginal gains and always those one percenters. Those are important, but we really wanted to get the core of the of the training program uh, fundamental first and foremost, and we believe that that is. Um, fundamental to the success of the New Zealand program as one example. Um, so yeah, keep it really, really simple at the end of the day. Do the simple things really, really well. Um, and then um, I really love this uh, um, paper by uh, Ross Tucker and Malcolm Collins. And it, it, to me, it really, um, you know, these on the, they just, this is one graph that you can see right here. And I go back to this on presentation after presentation, but here's your, Here's your athletes, your individuals that might rock up in front of you if you're a coach, right? A, B, C, D, E, F. We don't know who we're getting. We don't actually know who that, what their innate ability is. Um, but what we do uh, and what that athlete does and chooses to do in terms of the training and the preparation and all the other things that are outside of the actual exercise itself, that's all going to... Um, elicit their genetic potential to the foray. And, and what we do as a, a collective group of, or a team um, with that athlete um, can make the difference in terms of um, pushing one person over, over the top, right? So, and again, to Lisa's situation, if we don't, you know, if we don't do things right, it's, it's actually possible that Lisa wouldn't have emerged like her road was, I, I believe that her her genetic potential was, um, I guess, just it, it was it was it was released ultimately by the team that was around her. At least, you know, and of course credit to Lisa as well, right? But it was it was really it always was a team effort, and I think it doesn't matter who you are dealing with. That's you don't actually know what that full genetic potential is sitting at, and um, you know I've, I've just been dealing with this one athlete who killed it in in uh, Kona as the Ironman. And I, I mean, I, if I was to look at her, there was no way I would believe that she could have done what she did, but she did it. And she followed all the, all the various different directions. We got a lot out of her. So this is our job. Um, and yeah, again, that's, we should always, if we're a support system, we should always be trying to help coaches ask the, their most important questions. And that's what type of training should I do right now? You know, when should I train more? When should I train less? When should I train harder? What's the type of training? When should I train easier? Okay, um, so it's always a puzzle. And, and again, coming back to hit science, it, it really is, it, you know, look at the puzzle piece that's in there, right? That's really, it's always been been about that. And I believe that we've got, you know, and, and of course, Gordon and the team continue to, to put the, the puzzle pieces together. Um, but here's another, some more fundamental principles that the maximal training adaptation that you get is going to be a combination of the regular um, uh, cellular level signaling. You got to get the signal to that muscle and other, um, other cells right so that you tell those cells to adapt in the right way. And then the other balance or the other the other um, problem that you've got is that if you're stressing all the time, your autonomic balance um, gets out of whack. So you're constantly juggling these things like what's the right training signal that gives me uh, an autonomic balance that I can kind of go in and out, out of and then um, to be able to, um, you know, I guess, optimize. I want to continue to adapt, but I don't want to kill myself um, because we know that consistency of training in other words, consistent cellular level signaling is going to be the best road to Rome. So that if you guys are as coaches and athletes, you're always sort of fighting with this. Um, okay. With your train. And that's why the polarized tra level of training tends to be uh, one that is very good. Right. So again, here's, here's a paper I wrote a long, long time ago, but basically you can get 
the same kinds of signals going on with different types of training, whether it's high intensity or high volume. Note the 2080, the polarized kind of thing there. And you can hit the master switch, PGC-1 alpha, and you can get the same kinds of adaptations with both high intensity training and low volume or high high volume training, low intensity. But you can get them at kind of different ways and, and at different um in different fibers as well, depending on which what you uh, what you signal. Um, yeah, so yeah, we always want to measure measure what matters, and hopefully we we try to do that. That's why the wearables are so important. Um, and again, I'm just going to advance through, again, in the interest of time, through this presentation. So, um, and I'm going to go to go to kayak and and this one here. Of course, it's all about this is this is now from Rod, so you can imagine the Wellington presentation that I gave. Now that Rod's kind of up on on the uh, on the platform, and he's these are the things that he was really focusing on is is earning that trust and buy-in from the coach. This is why a, a combination of a of a good physiologist that's monitoring and and assisting can be very very strong and in alignment with that coach, right? And uh, and again, um, the thing that I learned from Gordy was the importance, and you guys will all know this, but the importance of stroke rate. That's really like, how can you maximize stroke rate? Because stroke rate equals boat speed. And Gordy taught me that. And um, and it was, I can't I can't tell you the amount of stuff that um, I learned from Gordon Walker. All right, like, you know, you might, you might, you know, you the big introduction that you guys gave me and you, you, you know, you fed my ego, thank you very much. But, um, you know, if, if I don't give all the credit to Gordon Walker, uh, and what I learned from him on a daily basis, well, you know, again, I'm uh, then I would be an ego-driven person, and I, and I and I'm not. Um, so you know, all credit to him and the team around us and stuff. Somebody's strong in seven. I'm not sure if you can see this because of the video capture rate, but this is just you know, like let's watch what Lisa actually did. On the paddles, out so quickly, and who gets the quickest start? You know, it's a big a dumpster of you playing up in lane one, going nicely. But Carrington looking strong in the black boat there, but there's a fiery start from Malta. And Valchakiewicz of Poland out in lane seven. She's out in front at the moment. Carrington hunting her down. Also, Osipenko Radomsk of Ukraine up at the top in the right-hand side of your picture there in lane one. And uh, Osipenko Radomsk is tied at the moment, it looks, with Marta Valchakiewicz as they come into the final 60 metres. But Carrington finishing strongly for New Zealand. Lisa Carrington with Dushev Janic just inside her finishing well. But Carrington, is she going to hold on into the final 10 metres? Lisa Carrington gets gold for New Zealand. It looked as if Ina osipenko Radomska for Ukraine got the silver medal, but Carrington, no doubt well, about was, winning the gold. That was weird. I, New Zealand, she's I, the world champion. She came and, from and behind. I used to seeing her in the ball. lead all the time. I didn't, I kind of forgotten that, that she had uh, come from behind a little bit. That's right. And remember that's the last time she came from behind. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, that's a really exactly. And um, that's that's the 100 percent, Rob. That's exactly what we noted as well. And I think that really that when we look at the training program that was done, we'll sort of see why that was. Starts wasn't a critical um, a critical piece, but you can imagine now Gordon reviewing these these tapes. Right. And he's like, you know what? Um, you know, again, this yeah. is when he's kind of young. We could probably do even better if we start working on starts. And of course, they, they've nailed that as well, right? But at the moment, in, in this stage of the game, you know, uh, 12 years uh, ago now, or, or sorry, yeah, 10, 11 years ago from now, that's that's really, it was the fitness and stuff that we were really focusing on, hence the, on, and the metabolic conditioning and these sorts of things. Um, so, so can you remember any, any specific kind of intervention that afterwards that helped with the starts? Um, you know, I think it was mostly just principle specificity, so and, and really a lot of a lot of work with the performance analysis team as well. Um, in terms of, I mean, there's lots of as you guys will know. And I was I was just watching, but you know, all of the various different balancing techniques and whatnot. You guys are you know you're in a bit of a an unstable environment to say the least, right? But it's like how can you almost like a like a swimmer? So I'm a swimmer a bit, so I understand you know that feel for the water and the sculling sort of thing. So what can you, how can you scull and, and capture technically, um, you know, the most um, most force and then a lot of gym work as well. So there's a, a real, a big emphasis into the, um, into the gym. Like look at, look at if you're left with that last picture, 
look at the shape of Lisa at this point in the game, right? And if you can see her now, um, she's a much, uh, you know, there's much more hypertrophy that's occurred um, as a result um, and functional hypertrophy as well, right? So I think the co it's always a combination of everything. So that would be my, that would be my guess. Yeah, so let's get, um, what else do we have here? Yeah, so this, this, was a, this was when it was a new, a new event. Um, yeah, and again, like, yeah, so strengths and weaknesses. And then, yeah, how could we kind of, like, again, you have to kind of put us back, how can we learn from other sports? Um, and again, yeah, so rate of force development is kind of at, at the end there and the cadence and the, and it was the, it was, it was, I remember it was always an emphasis on, on working on stroke rate, um, because we always knew stroke rate, stroke rate equals, um, equals boat speed. It's all, it's, you know, it's boat speed at the end of the day, right? That matters. But then how can we also link the metabolic system? And, um, yeah, and again, I, I think I'll probably just leave it. Maybe I'll leave it here a little bit because you can kind of see, here's the, again, as a coach, I'm always kind of interested in the programming puzzle uh, coming into, uh, you know, on a sort of a daily basis. And what are sort of the key pieces of the puzzle that um, that are important to have in the recipe or the the diet of, uh, of the athlete, right? And of course, it's always going to be individual, but, you know, here's... Here's Lisa's, you know, here's Lisa's work way back when, 12 years ago. Uh, and I, I would just, I wouldn't think things are that much different in terms of the bread and butter. Because again, as we mentioned, foundations is, is key. So you should be having all, you know, look at all the starts that are in there. And those probably have, incre have improved. And um, again, um, if you've, if you, you know, to your question, Rob, you're saying, well, what's, what has she done on the starts and stuff? It's probably been more of the, really more of the same. But it's again, it's the link, link with the strength and conditioning stuff. Um, yeah, and you can, cause you can kind of see, you know, you can see the gym works that, that's in there as well. This is, um, these are weeks. So the microcycle, this is, these call it a weekly microcycle, right? Um, five, four, three, two, one up to the event. So a minute, bit of the taper and stuff. And, um, you know, the, the, it's color coded in terms of the sessions that, well, Rod and probably Gordy are thinking are really taxing ones, right? versus the ones that are quote, moderate, probably in orange, short intervals. So there's long intervals, short intervals, starts. Um, yeah, you can see a lot of a lot of full gas sort of stuff here, or a, few, a bit of full gas stuff. Um, yeah, and and yeah, I, I'll, I'll kind of, I think that's that's been my 10 minutes and I don't want to um, okay. overplay, overplay, but I hope that's maybe lays a nice that's great. for for some Thank good, you good discussion and then we can continue with questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Paul. That was good. No worries. Uh, yeah, I think that was a great introduction and to HIT and what we want to discuss. Um, do you mind telling us what HIT is and the physiology behind it, what exactly it's targeting and how it's different from low intensity training? For sure. So. Uh, so HIT or is high intensity interval training, and and it's just its classic definition is it's basically it's broken exercises as you can see you know Gordon's doing a lot of broken exercise uh, pieces um, so it's high intensity above your threshold followed by a period of, of rest and of course you can do more high intensity work when it's broken as opposed to if you were just gonna just gonna train hard all the time your body just you, you can't you can't do as much high intensity work. And of course, when we, we just looked at that video of Lisa winning the 200 in London, you know, she's, it's very high intensity, right? So you'd better, you know, it's principle of training specificity. You want to, you want to maximize your ability at the very high intensity. And, you know, it doesn't matter, even if you're, if you're, if it's K, if K1, K, K1, K or, or, uh, or 500, it doesn't matter. It's like that's that's all way well and truly above the threshold. So you need to maximize your performance above there, and you can do that if you do it broken in various different ways. You can um, hit hit training is the way to go about that. Right. Can you give us an overview of the three metabolic targets? Yeah. So um, the three targets of hit, um, two are metabolic and one is neuromuscular. So the first the first one is uh, an aerobic stimulus. 
So, um, and that's when we think about the aerobic stimulus, we're thinking about the heart, uh, heart and lungs, the cardiovascular system, the, the system that is taking in the oxygen and delivering it into the muscles. And then the muscles have their peripheral, um, you know, um, componentry as well, where with things like mitochondria, and I was showing you all of the molecular signaling that, that goes on if we want to geek out. But basically, that's the, that's what's making more mitochondria. The mitochondria are the, the powerhouses of the cell that produce the energy, they give you the ATP in order to um, in order to produce that energy to make to move you forward. So that's just the aerobic system. The anaerobic system is the sugar-based system that that burns lactate, and uh, and that can work in the absence of oxygen. And then the third system is the neuromuscular system. Um, and then the like, I guess the the neuromuscular system. Think of like muscle soreness. Think of muscle recruitment. Think of anything that's technique. Um, these are these are where your um, your 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 mind, your nervous system, all the you know all the nerves and stuff collaborate with your muscles to deliver the performance ultimately, and that can be <laughs> in various ways. Yeah. Can you think of some examples of neuromuscular that we experience in our sport? Like, I don't think it's something we talk about a lot, at least that term. Yeah. So if I was going to do something uh, in the, yeah. So something in your sport might be in terms of a neuromuscular set, it would be like, you know, uh, dragging, um, you know, dragging something behind your boat, right? Like to sort of slow it down and you change, you're changing all of a sudden the, um, I guess the way the boat is actually responding and in doing so you might be like slowing your cadence down or you're slowing your stroke rate down like creating like a long like a, a longer harder stroke so the example in swimming which would be comparable would be like using uh, a pull boy and paddles or using a, like a, a a bungee around your legs or like you know bungees around mm -hmm. boats as well would be the same sort of thing anything that adjusts the neuromuscular way that you normally deliver power and uh, propulsion to your boat would be um would be the an, an example of a neuromuscular stimulus in your training and what about uh, on on dry land like uh, with respect to strength training that's all of a neuro. That's all. Your entire gym program is a neuromuscular day. That's when you're, you're creating. You're creating neuromuscular awareness in that. Moment. So, yeah. Is, is difference between uh, like max strength or hypertrophy and, and like a circuit style training. Yep. Like well, you know, de depending on what you do, the um, it's it's all it's all contributing to that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, there's all the various different philosophies and stuff on what type of training I will do, but, um, you know, whether it's specific, like whether I, you know, whether I go up to my, um, my rack here and start doing things that are very specific, uh, versus, a, a running around the gym and doing a, doing a circuit training and stuff. But regardless, I'm going to get, probably get sore from that. Metabolically, it probably won't be that, that taxing, you know, but neuromuscularly, it will be very taxing. And I need to take that into account, especially when, um, if we go, you know, imagine going back to your, the picture of the, the training plan, you want to protect the sessions around your training plan that are the key ones, right? So you remember we have the different colors of those, of those sessions, like, you know, the, the red ones and the orange ones. You need to protect those sessions because they're the most important sessions in your training plan. So you don't want to be neuromuscularly fatigued for that session because you won't get as much out of it. Remember, there's so much that's um, into the, 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 we can't underplay the importance of athlete belief, athlete belief in their program, athlete, and when an athlete sees themselves doing really well in a session, it can be very, um, you know, it can be quite motivating for them and, and driving them sort of forward. So, um, mm -hmm. You know, unless you can you can um, convince them that per, before that you're gonna you're, you're not gonna go well in this one because we did that yesterday these sorts of things. But right, right, yeah. So we always have to think about the mind of the athlete when we're when we're working with them on the on the water. Okay, great, thanks. So these these high intensity intervals are obviously high stress, high lactate. Um, can't do them all the time, but is there a way to get some sort of intensity? 
and also get an aerobic benefit uh, in something where where you can manipulate the, the work to rest a little bit where it's a little bit less uh less stressful yeah yeah no i think i know exactly what you're getting at rob and it's um that really kind of comes down to short intervals. Short intervals are a fantastic stimulus because believe it or not, you can actually get to VO2 max on your short intervals by if you strategically plan these short rests between them. Because what, what was discovered by Astrin in the 50s um, and you know, running coaches, uh, I guess, began to understand this as well, was when there was a pause after a high intensity um, bout that's maybe only like, so maybe you go hard for 30 seconds and then you rest for 30 seconds. In that 30 second down period, um, it is enough for this protein in your muscles that's called myoglobin. It's like the muscle equivalent of hemoglobin and it rapidly resaturates with oxygen that's floating around in your bloodstream. And in doing so, it creates a, it, it keeps lactate at bay. So what they discovered was when you were doing 30 on 30 offs repeatedly, is that you can um, you can keep lactate really, really low and still get to VO2 max. So in doing these sessions, you'll see that's why they were orange on that template because they're not as stressful as doing like a long interval. A long interval is more like the, you know, the sustained stuff, like two to four minutes. These are long interval type sets in our book, which ha- come with a lot of that anaerobic second metabolic system we were talking about. Whereas the 30 on, 30 off, utilizing the myoglobin um, keeps lactate low, yet the aerobic stimulus can still be quite high. So, yeah, I, I believe that. I know that a lot of the the short interval stuff is is used in Lisa's program and and um, yeah. gets uh yeah it, they're excellent. So hopefully some of the coaches are you know nodding and they they know the power of this. That Great, thirty thanks. seconds rest would that be passive or active? Passive is best. I mean you just just you know just just keep in the boat from tipping over right like just just turn just turn over a bit but mostly passive. Um, you want your emphasis on the emphasis on the work interval almost always because again, go back to the video. What's important at the end of the day? Moving that boat as fast as we can. We want all the effort on the on the work phase, and the, by doing so, you know I, I think there's the there's an old myth, unfortunately, where you know you need to move your muscles and continue to actively recruit those muscles in order to um, clear lactate, which used to be thought of as a, you know, a nauseous byproduct, but that's just not the case at all. Lactate's a fuel. Um, it's, it, it's, I don't know why it's associated with the hydrogen ions that are beside it, but that's just, um, what winds up happening if you're active, if your recovery is too active, then you are taking oxygen and recovery material away from the fast twitch muscle fibers and their ability to deliver power in the um in the work phase you should be focusing on the work the work intervals that's those are the ones that are going to actually matter the recovery should be all about trying to recover for the next bout that should be the focus for the athlete at that point in time that's a really that's a really important question and uh yeah i hope that was yeah grasped Mm -hmm. yeah um so if you were to have a a sprint can you kayak chapter in this book um what hit that's my book weapons, by the way <laughs> what hit weapons would you uh suggest our best practice in our sport yeah i think the probably the you know the ones that are definitely in the that were on that template that i just showed so mm-hmm. um that would be short intervals and long intervals and then of course um Probably some repeated sprint trainings, but specifically emphasis emphasized with um, with a start in play as well, right? So the re- repeated starts ultimately, we, yeah, um, you know, but you don't have to go you don't have to go too too long. So so it would be yeah, those those would be the key hit weapons that you, that you would use. Short intervals, few long intervals um, because it's specific to the event, and then but and then start based repeated sprint training. That's those are the pieces, like those are the pinch points in your in your event, right? You want yeah. you want high stroke rates 
and you can develop those with short intervals. You want specific um, specific training, you know, that at race pace, and you ultimately get those with long intervals. And as we saw in that video, the start is important. It wasn't great in in 2012. But Lisa had the metabolic conditioning nailed enough to beat her competitors. And then, of course, subsequent Olympics, she nailed the starts too. And now she's, she's so fun. you know, you add them all together, and you know, world beater. Yeah, yeah. So, Paul, we we've all been taught the linear model of uh, energy systems, right? Like from left to right, uh, alactic power, and and so on. Um, your interview with uh, on your on your Hit Science podcast with uh, Dr. Peter Way and kind of blew me away. Where he was talking about how sprinting was purely mechanical, like technique and and force, uh, and not so reliant on energy supply. Can you elaborate on this a little bit and? Yep. Did we get it all wrong thinking about the energy system pathway in this in this manner? I believe we did, Rob. And again, you'll notice when you asked me what the three energy systems were in the beginning, I didn't mention the A lactate and the and the you know the ATP PC, even though I was taught that as well. It's not and we're not saying it doesn't occur and whatnot. It's just and, and that it's not going on. It's just you're not you shouldn't be thinking that way. That's not really what you're tra you're you're trying to train. You're trying to you really, you're trying to train the neuromuscular system, right? And that's, it's the same sort of thing. So when we reflect on Peter Wayan, uh, and you know, he's done a course, uh, you know, a full course on this for us with Hit Science, but we just even go into the podcast, um, you know, and he, he's talking about Carl Lewis and he's talking, um, you know, how about, you know, he was just completely one of the weakest athletes um, in the day in the gym, but, you know, this is the fastest man on the planet at, at various different times. And the reason was, is because he can deliver um, a neuromuscular punch to the ground faster than any other man at that time, right? When he was breaking, you know, one of the first guys to go under 10 seconds, right? So he's like, again, that's from the sprinting context, but it's the same thing. It's the, um, you know, again, let's look to Lisa. She's learning to punch the water. Uh, and, it, you know, yes, she's incredibly strong in the gym. But it's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to transfer. It can a bit, for sure. And it ha probably has. But it's like, we're not really working on her ATP PC system. Think about, think about it um, more, in the, especially in the sprint context. Think about it more like a boxer applying a punch to the face or a sprinter like Carl Lewis or whoever delivering a punch to the ground and um and think about it in a neuromuscular force application kind of way and um that's really what as coaches that's that's what we should think about in terms of uh, what we're trying to train um and then and then of course the metabolic systems after but for that like I, mean, I think we're really talking about the start here right rob so yeah, that yeah. in that issue right so that's that's think about it that way i would yeah okay thank you um, what are your thoughts on training sessions that target more than one intensity zone and what type of athlete does this benefit the most? Sorry, the one more, more like, um, what is your thought on training sessions that target more than one intensity zone? So oh. sessions that are more blended um, rather than focusing on just one zone. Yeah, the old toothpaste theory, right? Like, um, yeah, like again. So the tooth toothpaste theory, which which kind of comes in through the book, is that you can you can basically squeeze a tube of toothpaste from the middle, and you'll get some some out, but it's probably not as effective as just squeezing it from the bottom or squeezing it sort of from the top in the various different times, right? So I think we, that was a bit of the analogy. Um, we do believe. That, that's kind of, we, we like to hit our target and walk away. So it's not to say that the other method doesn't work, but we believe that a targeted approach, um, especially in the high performance context, is the better road to Rome. So, um, and that's why, again, you go back to that, that um, uh, you know, what what we showed you with the color coordination of, of Lisa's plan going into London, right? Like every session is different and it's specific and it's targeting a certain adaptation in that that one and it's you know one day starts one day's you know one day short intervals one day's long intervals um yes it's all kind of one day's gym yes it's all blended and stuff but it's you know every session kind of has a purpose and we're hitting a certain target on that day um and there's not 
yeah, there's not a ton of blended sort of stuff that are in there. So it's not to say that the other method can't work, but that's that's our philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, go ahead, Rob. No, are we gonna move on to fiber typing now? And yeah, yeah. yeah. So we've found that uh, speed has been a bit of a controversial concept in our sport. I think traditionally we've been uh, been more of an endurance bias, and that shifted a bit. You know, 15 years ago when the 200 came in, uh, though I remember being a national junior coach and talking to a, a club coach and, and talking about the need for speed and doing a bit more, you know, earlier in the year than they might have historically done and, and thinking it was a good idea. And he had his athletes do like a one minute piece. And this is a, you know, someone that was a really good coach. And I, I you know, I, like any of us now would consider 60 seconds to be like a, a speed piece. Um, I think those those that education has has changed a bit, but there's certainly still some coaches out there that uh, you know don't don't train speed at all. They mostly train endurance, and and they still do well. But uh, but how would you define speed, and and how should coaches approach uh, speed with respect to high performance athletes and and development athletes? Yep. Um, again, for in my experience again talking to gordon it was all in our discussions when we're talking about things it, it was always back to the stroke rate how can we improve the stroke rate so that was that was kind of our focus and so and again all of those different metabolic systems they should come with a certain stroke rate we were always you know recording the stroke rate around those different sessions as well right what is this stroke rate at this you know what does it kind of look like in all those different pieces so um and again, if you go back, I guess a little bit in your question, you were talking about sort of the just train more, right? Miles, miles win medals kind of philosophy, which is rampant throughout, all, you know, many of the the water-based sports like um, like rowing and uh, and of course kayak as well. And, and and for sure, like there's there's that, that's a that that gets you to a certain point, but. Again, if you look to Lisa's world champion, you, you will see there's everything that's in there. Right? It's not just, yeah, there's lots of, you know, I'm just looking at the session right now, right? But there's lots of you know, 10K recovery, 10K float, uh, these sorts of things, right? Like it's, that's a that's a part of it, no question. Remember the 80-20 rule that I sort of showed? But I think you're, I think you're leaving a really important uh, piece of your performance um, un, untapped if you don't also include the, um, the, the speed stuff as well in those in terms of those other pieces of the puzzle that's my opinion i think that leads us into the next question courtney yeah so there's three types of athletes sprinty or twitchy as you like to call them hybrid and endurance and that informs like fiber typology informs periodization so which model pyramidal block or polarized works best for all these athletes each yeah year. super super good question and and it, th those two questions do interlink right so again the miles wins medals philosophy works great for the diesels right the diesel athletes the athlete that can just go and go and go uh they would just you know they can eat up the um the miles wins medals um you know uh philosophy and training program if Lisa had met a coach that believed only in the Miles Wins Medals philosophy, Lisa would not be Lisa today. There's no way. She's look at her, look at her, look at her. She's like, she's hybrid, or she, yeah, she's she's definitely a hybrid. Like she just she would not have gone as well. So, and how do you know what you have? I I go to coach's eye. You as a coach begin to see the athletes. Who are um, who are twitchy, who are diesel, and who are hybrid, and then kind of everywhere in between, plus some testing, so in laboratory testing, sprint versus you know VO2. Um, but you you know you develop that also with your co your coach eye as well. You start to see if you, if you're monitoring your sessions, you know you're seeing you know the your your diesels they can go forever and they just don't don't get tired on water they recover super well between sessions your twitchies on the other end um your your fast twitch guys and gals they won't go so well they won't recover well between sessions they um and they'll be if they're in a miles wins medals type group they'll start to feel overtrained and they'll want to drop out 
um, and you need to you need to supply them with the short interval um, more with the short interval work that we just spoke about. All right, so they're going to if you keep lactate at bay for them, they're going to back up. So more of those orange sessions that we sh that we showed in there, they then you can keep them in the program a lot longer, um, as opposed to getting dropouts because that's that's the problem. Is uh, again, remember when we talked about in the introduction, we talked about regular cell signaling and autonomic balance. So the the diesels, no problem. They're always going to be the mitochondrias are so high. They're always going to be in autonomic balance because they're wired to do that. But if you have a twitchy person, a little bit like Lisa Carrington, and you don't give them adequate rest or the right sessions, including short intervals to recover between, you're going to um, there there'll be some so it, to drop out. So from what you're what you're saying, does it sound like someone like Lisa would be better suited to a, generally a more polarized? Where there's some low intent, a lot of low intensity stuff, and then when it's time to go, she goes, and and the the yep. diesels or the endurance types might might be able to handle more pyramidal or even or even intense block during the competitive season. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So they can just recover better. Yeah. 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 The, the, okay. the diesel diesels will recover all day. You know, you 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 know, everyone's sitting here with, and they've they've got experience. Everyone on the call has experience, and they have this athlete. They have all these athletes probably in their mind if they've been around, and you know the ones that sort of um, probably you know I'm talking about. You probably have model. You know, you'll you'll know some that are whining about overtraining all the time because they're probably your twitchy athletes. Again, as a guess, you'll have some that can go and go and go, and those are your diesels. And um, you can, but I mean, you're. You're talking to a physiologist and uh, and a scientist. So I, if my science hat on, you should get some more data to confirm that. But with my coach hat on, because I'm that as well, that's probably what you're seeing yeah. is my best guess. Yeah. Thanks. Good. I think you answered this next question partially, but maybe uh, um, th there was that Belgian research on the uh, on the recovery of fast twitch versus slow twitch. Yeah, yeah. Phil uh, Bellinger. It was, it, it, yeah, so it's just amazing the... Uh, if you could speak to that a little bit, uh, like just the difference between the two types, it was quite remarkable. Yeah, totally. So F Phil's done a really, uh, Phil with the Bell Phil, so Phil's in um, Australia, but he works with uh, the Derave lab that's out of Belgium, you're right. And basically what they've done is they developed this technique using ultrasound where they scan the ultrasound of the, mus of the muscles of the athletes. And this is mostly, mostly in runners, but there's, I think they're looking at all different types of athletes now with this new technique. It's it's still evolving, and they've basically when they do this, they can they can get a non-invasive as opposed to going in there and doing a muscle biopsy on the individual. They they get a they get a pretty um, reliable indicator of an individual's how they're wired: fast twitch, hybrid, slow twitch. So, and what they found in more and more studies is just what I was talking about, where um, when you overreach both of those groups, right? If you like basically scan everyone, put them in one group or another, and then hit them with heavy training for, for a three week block. And what do you kind of find? And you find exactly what I just talked about. You said like the, I said, the, the, the diesels, the slow twitch, they can just, they don't, their heart rate variability or their, their fatigue perception. No problem. I can handle it. I'll just keep going. They don't overreach. But the twitchy guys and gals um, or hybrids, they start to overtrain and they go down and down and down slowly over that three weeks. And that's what the research says. Yeah. Okay, great. Courts? Um, if an athlete is following a program that's tailored to their fiber type, which inevitably is their strength. Like, when is the right time to address or improve a weakness? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, maybe we don't really know our our um, belief at this point in the game is that you probably want to feed the athlete their strength. So. Um, it's, I don't think you can change their wiring because it's genetic and that's what they're given. That's what they're, we're all born with whatever we're given. Um, so we'll, and then, and in doing so, we'll all have a strength and a weakness. So let's take for the, so again, if I'm uh, with my coaching hat on, 
if I am training a diesel engine athlete, I'm giving the diesel engine athlete more of the stuff that I know they can handle. They are probably falling into more of the miles, wins, medals type training philosophy, more long intervals. They'll still benefit from, from some sh short intervals as well. Of course, they'll benefit from starts, but I'm not going to try to, um, and then, and they probably won't go super great in the gym. Um, but you know, they'll still get a, a, a little bit of all of those things, but I'll probably focus on, um, giving them yeah, a higher volume of training plan than I would the, the twitchy. So again, conversely, the, the twitchy athlete, there's no way I'm going to give them a miles wins medals, um, program except to test it on them just to confirm my suspicions yeah. so i was like okay we're just going to go through a block i'm just going to confirm my suspicions i'm pretty sure you're a hybrid or a, or a twitchy person um let me yeah. i'm just going to observe you and then again so, if you start, start seeing them going downhill then you know right yeah. away. so if i follow up to that like obviously we, we train a lot of volume low intensity zone two kind of stuff but we we certainly have some athletes out there that are kind of allergic to training like that we know who you are out there <clears throat> nick matt Vive. Um, um but so you know these guys don't want to do 10 hours a week of uh of uh, zone two um w what's a way to work with these people to speak to their strengths um where they can still d get some aerobic uh development so like thinking of like some of the sprint intervals or, or whatever yeah i would do i'd be doing more short intervals work more more short interval work again the short intervals are just brilliant because you can you, and there, there's a whole chapter in Hit Science, Courtney, uh, the book you've got, where you can actually look at all the various different combinations, right? So again, um, you know, even like something like 10 on, uh, 20 off is, it, you know, repeated sort of thing is fantastic aerobic development. You think, oh, 10 seconds, what, what's that going to do? But because you're having now 20 seconds off, there's a really, there's a whole lot of kind of recovery time between that. To bring everything sort of down, keep lactate really low, and um, and just yeah. So you in and in in the twenty seconds you can kind of just paddle it. But you, you know yeah, it's just shorten the duration down, but still have sort of a high com high intensity component into it as well. Um, and probably they you know they maybe they don't need if ten hours is the benchmark standard, maybe they don't need that. But this is this is where good monitoring is going to be really important as well, right? Like so. Let's not guess. Let's put some good monitoring systems around our athletes using wearables. And maybe the athlete, if, if there are, I didn't, I wasn't aware there's athletes on the call, but you know, um, if I look, look at that presentation. Not anymore. He probably just got off. Probably, yeah. <laughs> but um, the, you know, some of the best, um, most successful athletes in that presentation were actually some of the rowers that took the monitoring um, into into account themselves. They invested themselves into monitoring work and they they learned themselves. Like, you know, if you, if you know some of these names like Mahi Drysdale, um, the, you know, Eric Eric and Hamish, the, you know, the, the Kiwi pair, these guys were right into yeah. all of their monitoring. And they, you know, if we look to Eric and Hamish, um, uh, they were completely different. We had on that boat, if you know the Kiwi pair and you know the New Zealand boat, the, you know, world record, uh, rowers in the in the pair that was that boat was delivered as a metal win with a hybrid so a hybrid to a twitchy guy in in terms of um, um, Murray and then Hamish was the the biggest diesel you could ever imagine so they had to completely train different and then they would get together on the same boat to train the same but their training around it was all completely different in accordance with their their um, their phenotype. They're, oh, wow. yeah, interesting. they're wired yeah interesting so i think we're going to go into the anaerobic speed reserve now um so our understanding is that it can be used to refine and tune the day-to-day -day training Just, can you explain what the asr is and how it's determined sure so the asr anaerobic speed reserve or anaerobic power reserve if you're in the cycling context or any sport there you can measure power is basically a way to look at what kind of athlete you have in front of you, what we were just talking about. Diesel, slow twitch, hybrid in the middle, or fast twitch, or twitchy is the nickname. And basically, um, by doing a, a formal test, like in the laboratory, you can have a look at, you know, whether you've got someone that's uh, 
you know, really up here in terms of sprinting ability and way down here in terms of their aerobic, aerobic ceiling. Conversely, your diesel would be shaped with, they're not very sprinty, they're not very, but they can go for on and on and on. And they're, they're kind of more in here. And then the hybrids kind of have a little bit of both, right? And, um, and that's, it's just a test that, that where you can do a maximal sprinting speed. So in the, um, in the running context, this might be like a, uh, what is it? I think they do like 30 meter sprint, uh, or they might be do a 50 meter sprint and they take whatever the fastest speed that you're actually moving. It's usually happened. It might happen around 30 meters. That might be your fastest point. And then you, and then compare that to the speed of your, uh, 1500 meter, like your average 1500 meter or mile kind of pace. That's usually the uh, a good marker of the aerobic bottom. And you could kind of, kind of do the um, a comparable marker in the uh, canoeing, um, canoe racing, kayak context, right? So uh, if you can measure your boat speed at, at, in a sprint test, and if you can measure that, um, you know, in a 1K, say for example, and, um, or maybe even yeah, no, 1K, 1K be perfect, right? So I'd kind of compare that, you know, your 1K time or performance or boat, you know, equivalent boat speed, compare that to the sprint speed. And then that would be your, you know, a nice little marker of what your anaerobic speed reserve is. And you could, um, you know, you analyze that and have those, have those um, beside uh, each athlete in, in terms of what, you know, phenotype, what fingerprint, um, you know, is, is sort of in, in front of you. Um, and that, that's a like full, a, okay. if you're interested in this area, we do have a full course on the anaerobic speed route, and it's done by Peter Wayand, who is the world leader in this, this area. Yeah, no, we, we did have a chat with Gareth Sanford too. We just, we had a hard time getting him, uh, pinned down, but, uh, you yeah. know, you worked with him and he's, he's in Canada now too, right? He's in BC and yeah, Gareth he's done some PhD student. pretty, he's pretty great. wild research. Yeah. Yeah. Courts, you want to go? Yeah. How can the ASR be used to develop pacing strategies? And do oh. athletes with differing ASRs pace differently? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, let me think. You know, I I don't know. I don't know how much that's going to going to impact. Um, yeah, I mean, what about? I would, yeah, I would imagine that you know you're, you're the the larger your VO two level in terms of your aerobic conditioning, the better you're going to kind of hang in there. Again, like let, let's let's reflect on Lisa's win there in the two hundred, and you, you know you. I learned this. It looks like Lisa came back and and came stronger. But really, she just all what we now know is she just slowed down less compared to everyone else, right? So everyone always they always go out and then they slow down. So it's like right, yeah. um, right? So a Lisa's aerobic conditioning was met so that she slowed down the least compared to everyone else. Um, so that's the that's what you're looking. You always have to keep in mind that's actually what you're looking at. You're not actually looking at her going faster. You're looking yeah. at her slowing down. Um, but we're not going to see as much pacing in the, in the 200 event, right? So for 500 and thousand, no, certainly. So similar, maybe, maybe similar though. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe I mean, simpler, like a simpler way to ask this would be like, because I think I've heard different people like Siegel and Bellinger say different things on, you know, if you're a fast twitch, should you should you pace the first half slower, or should you go with your strengths and maybe go a little faster? So I think I've heard conflicting things. I, so I'm wondering I, I, what. I'm wondering how you reconcile those. Yeah, I, I have to, I've heard conflicting things as well. And I would think the yeah. jury's still out there. Um, and context will matter so much. And I'd say you you coaches and athletes in, you know your context better than me. And I think I would think that this is something that you play around with and figure out what sort of works best with uh, for you guys. Um, there is something to be said by, with, you know, from the whole philosophy of putting as much um, forward facing momentum into the boats, it, you know, like, you know, you don't, I've, you don't really want to leave that in the tank. You don't want to be pushing and um, putting all of your energy to, you know, in the last 20 meters only, you know, and 
you know, just to think that it could, because as soon as the race is over, that you, that momentum just continues to cross the line, right? Like you want to put everything into it, um, be, you know, because the boat continues to kind of move forward. So you don't want to leave it all till the end, but you probably want to leave a little bit. And um, yeah, I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grasping at that one, if I'm honest. Okay. Yeah. No, interesting. I, I'm, I'm sure there would be a lot of opinions out there from the, uh, from the audience, but are, are we, uh, are we going to open it up for questions now, Courtney? Yeah, I've been seeing lots of questions kind of coming yeah. up. So, yeah, um, so it's I'm time. Sorry, I... Paul's Paul's <laughs> willing to stay on a bit longer. Usually, we we plan for sixty, but we he's okay for another ten or fifteen. So, uh, uh, is Haley going to ask people to come on? And yeah, I can do that. Um, Emma, you're first up. Do you want to come uh, on off camera? Zoldy. and ask your question. She's she's on camera. Oh, sorry. I mean, off off mute, like your mic. <laughs> off mute. Yes. I'm sorry. Speak. <laughs> well, my, my question was kind of answered in the discussion between like working on somebody's strengths and training based off their strengths versus looking at weaknesses and trying to improve that. So I was originally asking the question, if you had an athlete who you thought was, it looks like they're more twitchy, they produce a lot of lactate, you know, more speed dominant. How can you tell if um, they're just relying more on their anaerobic system during like aerobic efforts or if they just have that low lactate threshold and need to improve their cardiorespiratory fitness? And I guess this is more of a question that would be more applicable to younger athletes and less applicable to like the high performance where you can, you're more sure about what kind of muscle fiber, fiber typology they have. Mm -hmm. so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. So I, again, with all these recommendations I've given, like context is everything, right? So what I might have said might not applic uh, be applicable to those younger, younger athletes. So really, really good point, Emma. And um, but you know, a lot of this will come down to your coach's eye. So if you're not using a monitoring system, like you know, a heart rate monitor or a, with a GPS can be a really powerful tool because you're actually seeing. If, it, if the conditions are right and you've got, you know, calm, flat water and you can look at repeated measures of heart rate over longer pieces, you're getting some indication of um, the, you know, the boat speed relative to, to the heart rate. Um, so that can be really good. And if you see heart rate drifting up and an athlete not able to, um, to keep pace with, um, and, you know, that corresponds also with, behavior. So, you know, if uh, lack, let's call it lactate or, um, you know, uncomfortableness is, is rising because they don't have a, a, a really solid aerobic system, they'll, um, you, you, you know, you'll see that you'll see the heart rate go up, you'll see the uncomfortableness kind of go up. Conversely, you'll, you know, your athletes that they go up, they can go all day, they've got really good aerobic conditioning, those that, you know, that's sort of the opposite one. So, and I, I, you know, especially as a as a young in a, in the young group, I wouldn't give up on their aerobic conditioning because um, that can certainly still sort of be developed. Um, so yeah, I would um, I wouldn't yeah I just I would even though you you might be your guess that they're twitchies, um, I would still still continue to you know feed them a little bit of aerobic conditioning because it's generally pretty good for all of us. Um, but yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question there. It's more your coach's eye and, and like, you know, I, I'm, yeah, there's no, there's no one, no one solution to every single person, every single athlete out there really is an individual that is a, you know, and, um, no one knows every, every answer, but we can use some of these, some of these principles to help guide us as coaches. Thank uh, thanks, Emma. Haley, we can go next. Yeah, uh, Francois, you have, I think, two or three questions in here, if you want to. I have two. I can pace myself, but uh, <laughs> if I have the floor, I can go for two. Uh, sure. Thanks for the awesome presentation. Um, I had a question regarding passive versus active recovery um, during short intervals. My understanding is that going for a passive recovery would lead to lower lactate levels, lower need for buffering, but also a lower heart rate and a lower VO2, right? So. My question to you is, wouldn't an active 
recovery, stress, the aerobic system more slash better? Um, or is it just a reflection of a higher need for buffering, the fact that the heart rate is higher during the recovery period and you start the subsequent interval with a higher heart rate as well? Yeah, it's a great question, and I can totally understand why it confuses, um, why our philosophy in hit science really kind of confuses everyone because it's not traditional, but it's just what the research shows us. So, for example, um, uh, Grégoire Mollet and colleagues, uh, oh, sorry, Greg, Greg, Grégoire Dupont and colleagues showed that when the athletes did 15 on, 15 off to exhaustion, um, they went two times as long when the, uh, when the recovery was passive compared to when it was active. And the reason why is because, so two, two times, it's like twice as long, right? We're talking like, you know, um, yeah, it was like 15 minutes versus seven minutes at high intensity. And the reason is, is because um, in the passive recovery situation, you're not taking energy away from the whole, um, your, your body systemically, to be able to kind of uh, recover. It kind of comes back down to that myoglobin. It's being resaturated. Your lactate stays lower. You are more comfortable. And in doing so, you can execute the most important phase of that training, which is the high intensity. Again, think, think of the video we showed with the kayakers. That's what you're doing. You're trying to go fast, uh, as fast as you can. So focus on the conditioning that's going to allow you to go to go fast and to do that take take um take don't waste your energy sort of during that that time um you're gonna get all of that other additional cardiovascular conditioning that you just mentioned around the rest of the program usually right so along your you know your your 10k float session your um you know your even your long intervals all these other pieces but for any hit sessions focus on the quality the quality work because that that will get you the better better road to Rome. You'll adapt faster. I understand the philosophy, but I feel like the longer the intervals and the associated recovery, the less this is true because of the fact that you will spend less time at, at or near VO2 max. Like mm -hmm. let's say the intervals were 30, 30s or 45, 45. Yeah. Um, the longer recovery kind of implies that you will have a more... Uh, like a, a lower metabolic stage during your recovery, mm -hmm. therefore spending less time at or near VO2 max. I feel like for 15-15s, I fully understand the philosophy you're talking about, but whenever the intervals go for longer, I feel like it's kind of like a, um, like a gray zone as to what should be the recovery between active and passive. Yeah, sure. So again, you, the, you as the coach or you as the... As the uh, as a scientist, you have you have full right to do whatever you feel you you know you believe in. Um, however, what you might be doing is you might be taking again. You look to Greg Dupont's work. You are probably not going to be doing as many efforts um, in in the if you're doing an active recovery. Your time to exhaustion will be less. Again, you want to do lots of work at the high intensity. You will fatigue if you if you do too much active recovery. You aren't you're going to fatigue faster. So you might only do uh, let's let's do even say like uh, two or three minutes on and uh, two minutes off. Let's think, let's think in the long long interval context. You're only going to do maybe three or four efforts. Where versus if your um, recovery is passive, um, you might be able to do six or seven. Um, and you're probably your outcome at the end of the day with six or seven will be will be superior compared to the the shorter time and because you've done more work at high intensity. Makes sense. Copy. Um, Ailey, can I ask my second question, or am I hoarding the conversation? No, go go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I had a second one regarding profiling and fiber typology. Um, mm -hmm. The usual 80-20 training intensity distribution my understanding was that it was developed as a surrogate for appreciating a um, like a very um, endurance, sorry, I'll take it back. For high, um, high level athletes that are very endurance diesel, I feel like the 80-20 makes a lot of sense. Would you say that a more twitchy athlete would benefit from a more 70-30 approach, 60-40 approach, or would you still maintain that same training intensity distribution 
no matter the typology of the athlete. Mm, yeah, I would highly recommend you listen to the, my most recent podcast on the Training Science Podcast with Billy Spirich, who's the leader in the polarized kind of world. He's done the most uh, extensive um, meta-analysis on the whole thing. And basically what he says at the end of the day, you don't have to go listen to the podcast or read all the papers, but basically it's it's so individual, like like you've just described. And yeah, so, so the simple answer is yes. Um, it will, with all of this fiber typing and you know concepts that we've thought of with the uh, different anaerobic speed and power reserves it's probably just uh it's it comes down to you guys with coach i to think of what that athlete needs the diesels are probably going to have more um you know it's it's it's, it's it's very complicated actually like it's it's not i wouldn't get to ultimately i wouldn't get too hung up with the whole 80 20 thing i would think about more about like the the your your work on a daily basis because all that 80 20 thing it, it it's it totally matters where you where are you cutting things off right and because that middle zone is such a gray zone uh in terms of you know like usually when we're talking 80 20s it's it's um that 20 percent usually relates to like so in some papers it's just the high high intensity stuff above the second threshold in some papers it's just the first threshold and it gets very gray so um yeah it's it's, it's it's a general rule only. Makes sense. Thank you so much. No worries, Good no. questions, Frank. We can pass it over to Karen if you're still on. Oops. Yeah. Then, on. then you, then you, Loe. Uh, I think actually my question was answered in in all of the the presentation the last twenty minutes. Um, yeah, just uh, there are some athletes that are still competing in two hundred meter events internationally, uh, the women canoe uh, events, for example. So um, that's a little bit different profile from the rest of the athletes now that are racing thousands or 500s in the case of women. So when we talk about preparing our athletes to race their best for their events, um, it sounds to me, well, this is where I get a little confused. I get confused over the, um, because there is some debate, the role and how much a role especially if you have an hy a hybrid athlete, not necessarily a fast twitch or just a pure sort of aerobic athlete, but someone who's hybrid. Um, where do you find the balance? Or, you know, in my mind, there should be definitely regular speed work in the program on a routine basis for someone who's competing in 200 meters. And the role of the, of the longer pieces, the 10Ks, for example, at GA1, uh, at a certain tempo, certain heart rate, or I should say stroke rate, heart rate, and so on. Uh, how do they, how should they ideally live together? That's my question. Hmm. Yeah. For, for an athlete like that. Well, the, you know, the longer piece session that you just mentioned, um, that's more of a recovery session. So that if that's done at an aerobic pace, you know, even though it is still stressful, um, it's, you know, it can be kind of buffered between some of the more higher higher intensity ones. And yeah, athletes should develop the resilience to to be doing those sessions, you know, in this is where the whole 80-20 formula kind of comes in, right? Like the 80% the training, the 10K float that you just kind of mentioned, um, done at a specific stroke rate and heart rate, that's, that's your easy sort of training from a um cellular or sorry what did we say um autonomic balance standpoint that shouldn't be disturbing the autonomic balance too too much so that's placed around the sessions um that are high intensity You're using that as almost like a recovery recovery session what you don't want to do is put the high intensity sessions too close together subsequently like you know back to back to back to back to back you know th that works in some that's block training but it's but it's um it can be risky and you can um yeah you've got to you've got to be able to pull athletes out of the that fatigue state because you want you you want to kind of keep them going walking down that tightrope of um of balance at the end of the day and not getting sick not getting injured so yeah. um it's it's it, there's no right or wrong way but it's up to you yeah. as a coach to figure out how that works best for you and your athlete so speaking of the back to back to back i think we have time for one more question which speaks to this uh 
Mr. Frederick Loyer. Yeah, Paul, I really like the way you, uh, this reminds me, Gordy, talking about the way you are to protect the session and you just talk about toxic distribution as well. I guess it's this puzzle that you try to put in place together. Uh, do, do you have some thought about the, you know, we heard from the guys from athletics, those Norwegian guys who are running fast. It, it seems that they have a, a window to, um, to do two sessions back to back, not the same. We can call that double, double threshold or double double. Do you have any thought about that? I, did you did you explore that things? And is it really a toxic distribution having a very hard day with two big sessions? So you optimize the day and then having more like in between uh, more easy easy days after or every two days. What do you think about that? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked the, uh, the 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 question, Frederick. It's is really really important, and um, it is a new understanding that I've kind of come to in the in the last little bit there's actually there actually is a page i don't exactly know where it is i think it's in the um concurrent training section of hit of the of the book um and it's comes from a bit of work of with gordy and um one of his um uh one of his workers in the program uh jess bush one of my phd students and she, what she did, and this was actually, this was in the New Zealand program. I'm not sure if you were part of this, uh, Frederick, but it, um, but it was basically, they looked at those back-to-back -back sessions. So they did an experiment where they, because we didn't know the answer to the question. We did both like a strength, a heavy strength training session in um, at one point of the day and a heavy hit session at the other time of the day, just like you said. And then we also did, um, you know, a washout period. And then three weeks later, we did the opposite profile where we did heavy gym one day, heavy hit session the next day. And to your point, what we found was that the heavy, heavy was the better formula. Athletes like to almost get this priming effect where it's like, just give it to, just give me a hard, hard day. Even though I'm like, it's going to be hard in the morning. It was almost like that heightened central nervous system stuck with them into the next into later on in the day versus when they worked really hard and then they, they felt it and then they went to sleep and then it's almost like the body was still in sleep mode the next day and they couldn't couldn't get up they didn't get as they couldn't get up as much to to deliver as much power the second day so and this was done in the new zealand um you know the best athletes that new zealand has and uh, in, in very small sample size, it was just six of them, but it was like six of their high performance athletes. So it's, we actually couldn't get it through peer reviewed because it was, it was an underpowered study. Well, it was all, all of New Zealand, but anyways, <laughs> all of New Zealand's high performance program. But regardless, um, it, it, yeah, it, it just confirmed for me in the high performance context, if an athletes can handle two a day high, high, um, that's, what I, that's what I like to do is, is um, gym and high intensity or even two high intensities to your point and then bring them out the next day 10k float you know easy yeah. easy 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 recovery session that's i like that did you say there was some research on that you mentioned a name we couldn't get couldn't get it published um but yeah but it's, in oh, the, okay. it's actually in the book if you even I don't know if you've got it um yeah look for i'm pretty sure it's in the concurrent training section chapter okay. six courtney so check yeah. that out Rob, okay. Rob, you can ask Jessica Bush. She's, she's in uh, in Canada right now, so she might be able to talk with you about it. She okay, is. Well, yeah, I'm sure she'd love to come in and, and present. Okay. To you. She's well, got we'll a whole PhD on the area, all in kayakers. Okay. All right. Thanks. I think we're going to wrap it up, eh, Courtney? Yeah. Um, before we wrap it up, Paul, where can people find you? You mentioned uh, your podcast. Yes, we've got the podcast, the Training Science Podcast. So please check that out. Um, it'd be great if you could, um, yeah, download and subscribe to that. Um, if you like any of this, if you want to professionally develop yourself, uh, especially around the area of, of anaerobic speed and power reserve, we have a, you know, an amazing course with the professor Peter Wand, who's the leader in the field. It's on the Hit Science website under courses. Sure. Um, is there a Black Friday sale or uh, Black Friday sale actually coming in? So if you you get on, you're going to see all the emails kind of coming in, and uh, it'll be 35 percent off, kind of coming off. So um, just just subscribe to Hit Science or whatever you know, like um, go subscribe to the newsletter, and you'll see it all coming in the next couple of days. And then uh, yeah, um, keep in keep you know in, in future years, check out Athletica.ai. 
is basically that's the technology arm of hit science and um you know it's all of the technology with wearables is put into there so all the training plans adaptive etc is kind of going into there including coach versions as well so that we have an assistant coach for for you coaches that are out there great thank you Haley has thank you. um spotify and your website in the chat for those of you that uh easy click right there thank you Haley. Um, Haley, right, are we able to i really enjoyed that everyone like uh, yeah again yeah. thank you super Haley. Uh, respect all of you and um and again really uh yeah appreciate great questions uh astute bunch and i wish you all the best with your with your work with with athletes so yeah thank Thanks. you Haley, well, are we able to stay on for a couple of minutes with paul and we can we can yep. uh, end it? Yeah, for sure. Okay, thanks. Thanks, right, thank you, everyone. That. Thanks for the messages. See you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate that, guys. Thank you. Yeah, Paul, that was that was great, man. Cheers. That was really it was, good. It was really, it was really fun. Really appreciate it. Really fun. Thanks, guys. All right. So take take care. We'll uh, 